Hello, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Get to look at each other before it starts. Hello. Ah. I love seeing the dark, like the nighttime and the morning. <laughs> Japan is still morning. It's oh, great. I'd like to begin with a poem by Po Chu Yi. Po Chu Ai, sorry, Po Chu Ai. A majestarial rock, windswept and pure, and a few bamboo so lavish and green facing me. They seem so full of sincerity. I gaze into them and can't get enough. And there's more at the north window and along the path beside West Pond. Wind sowing bamboo clarities aplenty. Rain gracing the subtle greens of moss. My wife is still here, frail and old as me but no one else. The children are gone. Leave the window open. If you close it, who will keep us company for the night? Leave the window open. <laughs> When we leave the window open, we create the conditions for wisdom and love to arise. And we, we speak of the conceptual and the non-conceptual. And when we talk about the conceptual, we tend to remind, remind us that concept is not a problem. You know, it's something we don't have to reject to be free, to be wise, to be loving. Very important. Um, and we emphasize the non-conceptual because we do need to open the window to have it arise. It's like uh, for most of us, the window is shut and we don't make enough air time for it. There's not enough air for it to breathe. So the non-conceptual at first can seem non-meaningful because again, we haven't left the, open long, the window open long enough to receive the teachings of the non-conceptual. The, there is a vast exploration of non-conceptual and it includes the unknown. It includes the truth of each moment of existence itself. So when we understand that each moment is new, there's more willingness to explore the non-conceptual, the unknown. We're more willing to leave that window open to explore. Often when we, um, have the privilege of doing a longer retreat, we see uh, the places where we did believe we could control how things are, or we see in the present how we're believing we can control how things are, or we see how we believe in the future we can control 
how things are. And when we do open that window and start to receive life directly, not through the conceptual thought process, we um, tend to have to face uh, why we're doing Vipassana. We're trying to explore the nature of how things are, not how we're wanting them to be. And so that believing we can control, we see that it's a kind of idealized version or wishful thinking and not how things mostly are. And often uh, what we get to see, which we often don't like, is, is the ways in which we control or have tended to control the patterns. So that, that we tend to like the idea of uh, letting go of controlling, but we don't often like that process of having to face the controller where we do control. So if you, if you kind of um, open to the definition, one definition of mindfulness is connecting the attention with what is happening, but not controlling it. That sounds great, but we have to remember that that means that we're kind of uncovering by opening the window. You start to uh, uncover uh, the ways in which we do control or believe we can control and how the doubt, doubt will arise when um, we're so disappointed or disillusioned with how things actually are or doubt in ourselves that we couldn't uh, make things the way we thought they should be. One of the um, instructions that I heard the late, great Mahasi Sayadaw give when he came to um, Insight Meditation Center in um, 1979, he just said that um, whatever appears in your experience to just say, this is not me, this is not mine. This is not who I am. Anything that appears, a smell, a sight, a taste, a touch, a thought, an emotion, you can keep it simple. <laughs> this is not me. You don't have to do all three. You know, they mean the same thing. This is not mine. This is not I. And so the shifting to to kind of understanding that um, if we could control aging, for example, one little thing, we would, right? Can we really control our body? Well, we do many things to keep ourselves healthy. So the idea of understanding that um, there's always a paradoxical aspect to practice. It's like connecting but not controlling. Uh, caring, taking responsibility for our body, caring about our body as being so precious, but also understanding that we can't control that it will grow old and die, for example, that that um, belief that we can causes us so much suffering. So I find that from when I heard Mahasi's teaching all through the course of my practice, that I started being more and more willing to understand when experience did feel like mine, did feel like me, did feel like who I am. Just like, you know, we talk about not controlling, but actually I had to face and keep facing more and more how I do control, how I try to control. It's the same teaching. It's like to explore, um, you know, the, the way a lot of people will talk about self-referencing. It's like it's bad, but actually it's the human condition, the meanness, minus, my fear, my sleepiness my aging, or like whatever. It's like that sense of it being me, 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 mine, mine, mine. And it, it's actually a developmental stage, as we all know, who've been around infants. 
and young children, uh, that sense of we have to learn that something is ours, mine, <laughs> before we can understand that it's not mine. Yeah, it's like an important stage, but we are, if we're on a spiritual journey, and we're on a retreat like this, it's so cool because you can have maybe um, anger come up, which is a kind of controlling, right? There's something painful. We don't like it. We're trying to push it away. Um, and one way to explore anger is to really get to uh, explore how our body feels like. How does it feel like mine? My mind right or my thoughts about it this is the um the hidden treasures of practice the more you are willing to explore you know i've told you like i have i've had chronic back pain since 1979 it's like it, it started i did something today and it kind of started hurting again and i was like the first moment of that twang in my lower back it, it'll it feel like mine. It'll be like, oh no, it's back. Like, of course, it's like, who, of course I don't want it back. And then it's just like, oh yeah, relax the attention into it. It's such a familiar old friend. Yeah, it's like, oh, I can just explore that twang, that tightness and and watch that shift, the beginning, middle, end of minus with it. We can do this with sleepiness. This is, people think sleepiness is an obstacle to liberation. But when we shift from understand, thinking that the sleepiness is mine to getting that it's just low energy that comes and goes, not mine, that's liberation. How do we do that? Well, if it's feeling my, like my sleepiness, you don't go, don't do that and try to, try to force yourself to understand that it's not mine because that's like not being with the nature of how things are. So that sense of the attention being light or malleable or flexible as Jesse was talking about last night, how liberation unfolds is in this place where we accept the conceptual rather than thinking, you know, exploring the sensations of the pain. Pain is a word for intense, unpleasant sensations. But when it feels like mine, we don't tend to investigate it or explore it. But first, it's, it, it's important to be able to unconditionally accept that it does feel like mine. That's equanimity. So be careful of that overlay of like, it should be like this versus how is it? It should be like this, believing we can, should control it versus how it is. When we, um, are attached to the result of our effort in practice, like what maybe we're, struggling with something like even attachment and or aversion or sleepiness when we can believe we can control it we start uh, practicing out of that place of believing it should be a certain way of course it will lead to what doubt disappointment or grief or we can get into striving or numbness, indifference, not caring. It's like there's many ways we can go from not seeing that those moments when we think it should have been a certain way. It's just a few moments of it. It's impermanent. Thinking something should be a certain way is impermanent. The uh, sometimes equanimity, this acceptance without conditions is translated as holy, 
holy equanimity it, that it because there's a shift from um, the attention being partial to impartial. Very important. And we've all been uh, referring to this, talking about it. It's like when you think that walking through the hallway is less important than sitting down to, to meditate formally, um, we'll, miss, we'll miss the experience because we don't value it. And impartiality includes ultimately the full awakening. <laughs> you know, it's like there's that sense that every experience is worthy of our attention. That's impartiality. So is when boredom comes up, is that worthy of our attention? Or do we have that sense like, oh no, <laughs> it's mine. <laughs> I don't want it, right? It's like, um, I find that so much of this path is the willingness to go from um, a kind of high drama intensity over time to more and more refined. But in that process, we're not rejecting drama. We're not rejecting intensity. We just start to have this impartiality where we're willing to go through these um, less refined spaces that tend to be boring and can lead to indifference um, if we're not careful there. If, for example, we're doing walking and uh, it's like, <laughs> it's like we can't bear taking another step because it just feels like, oh, it's just another step, right? But it can be eating. It can be anything. It's like hearing, even hearing the beautiful sound of a bird, um, anything, if we stay with it long enough, is going to start disappearing and um, get less intense and less, um, less refined. And there's stages. I, I guess one could say there's stages of boredom. and the willingness to go through them. It, it's kind of like um, seeing someone out sailing. I'm not a sailor, but whether you're windsurfing or sailing or anything that is um, needing the wind and when the wind stops, right? It's like, what do we do when our wind starts to stop? And can we be still there and be okay there and often when we do, there's a shift in the practice. Um, it, we tend to say deeper, but it, it can be very, very, seem very mundane, very ordinary, but there's just a, a different way that the perception is receiving reality there. And this, um, This includes um, this, this kind of need, this human, very human need for inten intensity. Uh, what, what starts to shift in practice again, if you're staying with it, staying with it, it does become tasteless at times. And we'll have aversion to it, but actually, again, if you stay with it, this is where liberation happens. It's that, it's that willingness to shift toward more neutral more impartial, less intensity, less need for experience to yield a kind of a satisfaction that it can't give us. So this peace and contentment and taste for quiet and calm uh, comes from willingness to go through these places where it feels like the our sail has stopped. It's okay. It's okay to go through these very um, tasteless, bored, boring places.
we um, often talk about aspects of concentration we call the first um, aspect of concentration but it's really a moment of remembering to be here we talk a the Pali word we talk a uh, it means connecting the attention or aiming the attention and then Vichara is the sustaining of the attention with what we've connected the attention to, right? These are the basic um, way that attention can come together to be here versus distracted and disturbed. And it can be very interesting to explore, well, how does Vitaka actually happen? But it requires non-striving. It, it requires relaxation. And however we can understand that kinesthetically is so important for us. So uh, I know um, if, I, if I ever have that gift or luxury of actually, uh, or trust to actually float, float in water, like that sense of floating in water, it can seem, again, paradoxical, but it's, that's how the attention is meant to sink in and connect with something. It's, it's, it's a uh, relaxing into an experience. So whether it's seeing, you know, we can, the, the attention kind of, can kind of move out with seeing and make objects, make a curtain, make a tree. It's like it, crea it can create duality or the attention can relax right, right with the eyes themselves. And there isn't a sense of duality or minus in seeing. You're just receiving color, light, shadow. Yeah, try it now. It's so important. It's like the mindful seeing cannot happen without relaxation. And often when we start being aware of seeing in this, eye, in this way, we'll start to feel this tension and tightness behind our eyes that's, that's, that's sort of there whenever we're seeing and we don't even notice it because we're, we're like making objects all the time versus relaxing into just seeing. And we don't talk about that as much as relaxing into hearing. Yeah, but then when I say this, then we can make it into the right way to be seeing is not to be making objects. So you see how careful one has to be in talking about this stuff. It's like if your attention is making objects when you're seeing, explore it. Check it out. How do we create the world? How are we perceiving reality? How are we making a you and a me and an I and an us just in two seconds of seeing? We do this with tasting, thinking, positive and, you know, like uh, pleasant or unpleasant or neutral emotions with everything. It's like that willingness to relax the attention rather than um, make it into, oh, I know what fear is. <laughs> I remember what fear is. I don't like it, and we don't relax into it. And we get caught in the thoughts about the experience, the concept, versus this is, the, this is a totally new moment of fear. It's never happened before. And this, um, I mean, I, I guess I can say of anyone, I know so much about striving. It's like in my practice, um, as each year went on, I got to see this kind of striving more and more clearly. Uh, and it, 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 it's like the liberation with striving isn't trying to get rid of it, it's in learning how to relax into it, see it clearly, understand it's not mine and impermanent and not, a, not bad or wrong. 
So I, I think it's funny. I like to stop just to like, re, you know, remind us all. It's like, again, that paradoxical nature of even talking about something to talk about non-striving can often make striving seem bad or wrong, right? It's like hilarious. Um, how easy one can fall into the trap of then one notices anything. Attachment, we hear being free from greed, hatred, and delusion. So if, if, if attachment comes up, we'll think, oh, no. But actually, that's not the practice. The practice is, oh, boy, I was hoping striving would come up right now because I need more practice with how to work with it. You see, it's the practice is opposite of how our kind of knee-jerk reaction is. The impartiality, again, it's that uh, holy equanimity is peace. And it, it occurs any time that equanimity actually appears. And it's not ours. And we can't make it happen. Amazing how much courage this takes. But we can assure you that the more you practice, that the conditions will ripen for equanimity to appear more and more. So lying down meditation, we talk about sitting, we talk about walking, we talk about standing at times, more often on an in-person retreat. But lying, we kind of have to talk about it more with a self-retreat because you might be doing a little bit more lying. And remembering how Ananda, uh, when he was lying down, there was a certain moment where he had been striving so hard to get fully enlightened. He was the only one who hadn't, you know, here's this great big meeting, it's his last chance, and he's so exhausted from just trying so hard and striving, and he's laying down, and something in him finally relaxes, and there's full liberation, full peace. So I have found in any time I do lying meditation, my first recognition is that it's much harder to strive lying down. It's awesome. So taste it, even if you're not doing lying meditation, but at night, but taste that sense of like, what does it feel like? That relaxation. And then when you sit up, you can even go back and forth, lie down, sit up, lie down, sit up, and see that that quality is what allows Vitaka to really happen, a relaxed attention. And I think that um, one of the great things about sleepiness that happens more if you're doing lying meditation is that those kind of dreamlike thoughts that will appear and I find them so liberating. It's like most thoughts when you're sitting or walking or, you know, normal life, they're much more controlled. But as you know this, we all know this because we've all been sitting long enough <laughs> the last few days. When you start to have that low energy and the weirdest thoughts appear, it's like they, they're startling sometimes, like where? Are these coming from? I mean, when I mean, talk about insight into anatta. I mean, people say, "We're oh, I'm not having any insight." Well, just look at dreamy thoughts. Are they yours? Absolutely not. You couldn't have even designed it. You couldn't even made those up. They're like awesomely random and bizarre, and um, I find them so helpful to like remind me that I'm not in control, anatta. But you know, mostly in most of my practice life, I had so much aversion to sleepiness, I never noticed any of that because I was trying to get rid of sleepiness and I was trying to do all these things to um, anything but accept it, right? I remember after a few years, because sleepiness was my hindrance of choice and Oh, did I fight it, fight it, fight it, fight it? And finally, I remember the first time, really, I just was like, oh, maybe I could try being mindful of this. 
you know, it says, I call it mindfulness as a last resort. It's just like, that's where I learned mindfulness as a last resort. It's like, wow, maybe I could try being mindful of this. But like now for me, it's not, it's not like I go, oh boy, low energy. But I know that it's going to lead me to more insight, more understanding my sleepiness versus oh, just low energy. And we can explore anatta from such a deep place of understanding with one weird thought. Attachment to clarity. Boy, as you start getting old, man, if you're attached to clarity, <laughs> You know, there's there's some more uh, for you young ones. There's some more low energy coming. I can tell you that, and it's like, boy, it's like really just attachment to a clear mind. You know, dullness happens. I feel like I should put that as a you know bumper sticker. <laughs> you know, dullness happens. It's not mine, but yeah, it's just the way it is. There was a great um, being teacher from Burma, uh, Tangpulu Sayadaw, that I met in uh, 1978. And the first thing he said to me was, um, he didn't speak English. He said through a translator, he walked right up to me and he said, keep a mind like water. He's a forest monk, keep a mind like water, not like a rock like water. So I'd like to read something. Um, this is from a book called The Gift of Rain by Tan Tuan Eng. And the character in the novel, um, he grew up in Penang and he's a, in the, in the uh, book, he's probably in his early 20s when he um, says this in his mind. Much as I love the house I grew up in, I had a greater love for the sea, for its ever-changing moods, for the way the sun glittered on its surface, and how it mirrored every temperament of the sky. Even as a child, the sea whispered to me, whispered and spoke to me in a language I assumed only I understood. It embraced me in its warm currents. It dissolved my rage when I was angry at the world. It chased me as I ran along the shore, curled itself around my shins, tempting me to walk farther and farther out until I became a part of its unending vastness. A mind like water, how it mirrored every temperament of the sky. That's our practice. This unending vastness that we're capable of exploring. But it includes love and wisdom, meaning that the Vitaka Vichara, it's like it enables us to connect where we are, to sustain where we are. But there's also that willingness to understand impermanence, to understand the unreliability of experience, to understand um, that there is no solid me or I or mine, that corelessness, that uncontrollability. So we love that sense of um, like a, a loss of the little self into the greater unending sea, right? There's that oneness. But Vipassana, it's like you have the oneness until you shift to observing what's happening and understanding its nature. It disappears. This is where love and wisdom come together in this practice. Most of us prefer <laughs> the connecting, sustaining, 
without the ending, right? It's like, that's why we're saying, you know, you need to take breaks. You need to um, lighten up. You need to have humor. Uh, we're bringing that paradoxical nature together, connecting, but not controlling. Not controlling, why? Because we can't. Of course we want to. This is from um, Shunrai Suzuki from Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind. I have always said that you must be very patient if you want to understand Buddhism. But I have been seeking for a better word than patience. The usual translation of the Japanese word nin is patience but perhaps constancy is a better word. You must force yourself to be patient. But in constancy, there is no particular effort involved. There is only the unchanging ability to accept things as they are. I think this is an amazing, amazing uh, translation, but also definition of patience. There is only the unchanging ability to accept things as they are. Often patience is described as a kind of metta, but here again you see um, that he's saying that patience, if it's forced, can be a kind of non-acceptance. But this isn't what he means by patience. There's that constancy. When I was um, in my first uh, course in botany with a professor, uh, Doc Brainerd in Springfield College, he assigned us all uh, a year-long assignment, which was to pick a tree or a, a plant or even a rock, but something that we would visit every day for an hour, Just sit with it for an hour every day, for a year. This was 1970. It was quite, um, very, very few people stayed in that class. <laughs> this was not what most people were signing up to botany for, um, but I found it so hard especially through the winter. Uh, I picked this plant, sweet gale, America gale, which is like a, a swamp flower that grows on the edge of the pond. And the winter was just so long and it, it was so hard to um, sit there with this seemingly unchanging experience. But there was always, if you sat there long enough, the weather was always different. There was always different sounds, different colors. Um, uh, I learned so much from that experience. And I, I drew it every day <laughs> for a year. And you, I hope you can hear that in that process of a lot of frustration, I came to feel so connected with this plant, but also that little pond and the um, trees around me and the sky. And, um, watching it in the spring. So I wanted to read a quotation from Thoreau. I like to um, look at his journals and kind of look around the date that we're in. This is September 8th, different year, <laughs> 1851. This year may be in its summer but it is no longer in the flower of its age. It is a season of withering, of dust and heat, a season of small fruits. Summer thus answers, there is an aftermath in early autumn and some spring flowers bloom again. 
followed by an Indian summer of finer atmosphere and of pensive beauty. May my life be not destitute of its Indian summer, a season of fine and clear mild weather in which I may prolong my life before the winter comes. When I may once more lie in the ground with faith as in spring and even with more serene confidence. And then I will wrap the drapery of summer around me and lie down to pleasant dreams as one year passes into another through the medium of winter so does this our life pass into another through the medium of death For me, Thoreau takes the seemingly mundane and um, has this extraordinary Vitaka Vichara. He has that ability to go through the boredom or even the indifference and find spring even in death. It's like this extraordinary um, ability to talk about it, to describe it. So this holy equanimity, the Buddha taught that we are born into the vicissitudes of life, always remembering that he means all beings and they, they come in pairs of opposites. Again, this paradox. If you're born a human, then you face gain and loss and fame and disrepute, praise and blame, joy and sorrow. And I think it's so um, easy to accept gain and so easy for most to accept fame or easy to accept praise and easy to accept joy. And somehow, because we get attached to it, right? It's like my gain or my fame or my praise or my joy that the Buddha talked about this inevitability of the opposite for all of us, for him, for all beings that there's if there's gain, there's loss. If there's joy, there's sorrow. If there's praise, there's blame. If there's fame, there's disrepute. And the um, unconditional acceptance is, it's like that peace, the peace that is described in this practice, this holy peace, it, it includes everything, right? It's not about just... Um, pleasure it's about pain it's about like Thoreau that that sense of like of course there's a long winter and how do we work with this well if you read Thoreau you'll see how much how attached he would get to spring <laughs> you know he loves spring and yet you could hear that he he died young you know he, he had to work with this um, other side of spring that fall the autumn, the winter. So when we talked about earlier in the talk, that sense of um, that willingness to go through the refinement when we watch an experience end, uh, that willingness to go through the weariness that hopefully you are tasting sometime. If you, you're sustaining the attention through things that will be like, oh, even if you just watch a sunset every day, even if you watch the stars come out every night, there will be a point where it's like, hmm, maybe I won't do this tonight. 
it's like we can we sustain it why because <laughs> we get bored we don't you know we don't want to go through that uncomfortability or that loss of um, familiarity to go to a deeper place with it so there's this peace that comes through whenever we feel blamed um, i think we get angry right whenever we feel misunderstood we get we feel angry and it's the willingness to remember oh the vicissitudes of life praise and blame right that, that there's that acceptance that oh can i work with this i i want i believed i could control i did my best I'm getting blamed is it okay is it mine or is it me or is it i and that that experience that seems so much like equanimity but isn't that in the translation it's called near enemy but the experience that seems so much like it i like to call it fake equanimity we're all really good at it you know i don't care if blame <laughs> i don't care if blame is coming up i don't care if low back pain is coming up i don't care if boredom whatever it is that we don't want to be happening you know I don't care if they didn't have the rice that I like at the store again after six months of them not having it. Whatever it is, it's just like, oh, we pretend that we're okay, but we're not. And that's dishonest. And I find that on retreat, you get to, um, it's like you get more naked, you get more um, humble as jesse said it's like that sense of oh is there a willingness to um okay is there a willingness to be honest no i don't want that yes i want this and ah oh, in that unconditional acceptance there's a deep contentment and we can see how there's that, that fake equanimity, there's that, the indifference. You know when you shift to not caring anymore. You know, I don't care, <laughs> I don't care, whatever. You know, it's like that's not acceptance, but you can see where it can be a protection, a defense of how things are and that it's okay. I think one of my great feats in um, my practice was when I started accepting numbness. Numbness in my body, numbness in my heart, not caring. Ugh. I had such a need to care all the time and it's so exhausting. And when I finally started letting myself not feel anything and accepting that other people were numb, one of my um, memories that came up during an interview today that is pretty funny in terms of present time, when I think back on that was happening in the late 60s, um, and my, my father and stepmother had retired. And in those days, a newspaper, the Framingham News would be delivered, you know, to the, the driveway. And, um, my father had been in World War II and worked hard at many things. And uh, my stepmother had worked, uh, but didn't get so involved in the uh, suffering or dukkha in this world as my father had. Uh, and so the paper would come and my father would be up first and he'd get the paper and um, he would read the comics. That's all. He would just read the funny, we called them the funnies, the funnies. And then he'd put the paper down. <laughs> my stepmother would make a cup of coffee and she'd read every painful. She just would read everything that was painful, everything that was wrong, all the suffering. And then she'd close the paper, have a cigarette, and she'd just rage at my father, like rage at him for not reading, you know, the painful news every morning. It was like, 
And when I would visit, it was so horrible. Really. And my father would be like, I don't want to read. <laughs> I was like, I was it's like, I want to just start the day with some joy. I'll read it like at four o'clock or, you know, he, he needed the way he needed to do it. She, she, but she, she wanted him to care in the way that she did, but there was care, but it was controlling, right? It was just like, you know, that's not really caring about my dad. And so when I would visit, which was, you know, I never stayed overnight because I never wanted to face the morning, you know, and I'd, I'd say, you know, this is like World War III. Could we, could we like stop it? But you could see like we do it in ourselves. We do it with each other. It's like that person, it doesn't care enough. That person cares too much. They should like, you know, what's wrong with them? If they're codependent, you know, like, oh, that person's narcissistic and, oh, there's so much judgment. And there isn't the ability to think, well, maybe that person is numb most of the time because they can't handle it. Ever think of that? Maybe they're doing the best they can. And maybe if you, if we looked at our own indifference and our own numbness, in the face of this range of joy and sorrow and pleasant, plain and neutral, that I find if I really truly accept my own numbness and difference, I can accept somebody else's and it makes for a relationship. It's like you have a relationship with indifference. You have a relationship with numbness. And then often the person ourselves, we feel safe and protected. And then eventually the heart will, will unnumb itself because it feels safe, not judged. And whatever, it's like whatever we do. And here's this impartiality again in the face of this human world and also world itself, this range of pain, pleasure, neutral, joy and sorrow. It's like we do our best, or we do the best we can with like connecting, sustaining, exploring. And then we have to take a break. It's okay. And we try to learn to take the, um, instead of holidays in hell, you know, my early fantasies and practice were all like really painful. You know, I'd create these incredible fantasies where I'd be like rejected and like sor sorrowful and lost and hurt. And I'd come out of these fantasies and I'm like, why don't, why can't I have pleasant ones? You know, I just, just like couldn't do it. And then I finally started um, sending metta. So, you know, that, that um, reaction that I was having to not being able to be with things as they are and to practice in the way that I thought I should, I would create a fantasy of something painful <laughs> that actually underneath that fantasy was actually the fear of rejection. But I couldn't go to that in those early years of my practice. I didn't even know that's what was happening. I didn't know I was afraid. But boy, when I started having metta for myself and compassion for myself, instead of judging the fantasy, I started to be able to be what? Not, not closed down, but starting to get a little bit interested in the fear and not needing the fantasy to protect me. Was there anything wrong with that fantasy? No, that was the best I could do at that point in time. And I look back at those retreats and I'm so grateful I had them to protect me. I wouldn't have made it to, I wouldn't have made it through the retreats. You know, we, we get all caught up and upset about things when actually you can look back and go, wow, I'm lucky I had that or I wouldn't have made it. I had a lot more to say. Okay. So relaxing our attention where we were a while ago into 
what is happening and sustaining it. Um, there are times when I think we forget that we can relax into impermanence, can relax into dukkha, can relax into anatta, we can relax into um, the sound of a bird that we love, we can relax into wanting, we can relax into physical pain or, or pleasant pain, we can re relax into neutral. So, and that's the impartiality, that's the beginning of seeing clearly. And when we um, contemplate awakening, awakening can only happen in one moment, like one nanosecond. It's like in one moment, it's complete. If you think of water again, keep a mind like water. If you look at one dewdrop, the whole world is reflected on it. And everything inside is apparent. Steve talked about what is apparent. Like the, it's like one moment of completely being here is awakening. The image of it, it's like a nanosecond. It's so quick. It's just like a complete relaxation and understanding all together. One moment. We try to do that for too many moments and we put pressure on. This, take, this actually requires no pressure, no striving, right? No ambition, no expectation. It's like, and please be careful of thinking that it can only happen sitting or walking. It can happen any moment where you just... accept unconditionally what is there without conditions, without condition. If you think of the image of the moon, the full moon as an image of awakening, all of the sunlight, right, is reflected at that moment in time. It's like, it's, it's like the moon has everything reflected on it at that moment. That's one moment. It's a, it's a metaphor for one moment of awakening. There's nothing sticky. There's no resistance to anything whatsoever. It's just like, whew, a complete moment of being here. No resistance whatsoever. Two seconds later, we might be in full resistance. That's okay. And then we just relax into full resistance. No problem. It's not me or mine or ours. This is the practice. It's like peace and contentment comes from that impartiality. It's like, oh, no, I was doing so well. <laughs> I was so present. And then it's like, wow, in two seconds, we can be in a nightmare. It's okay. It's like that ever-changing mind like water. The whole sky, every cloud, every storm reflected and passes away. So we fall into, we fall into the truth. We fall, we drop into what's happening. It's a, it's a letting things be just as they are. Okay, that's it. This is from Hanshan, the cold mountain poet. Hmm. The Dhamma. Before I read the poem, the Dhamma is invisible. It's timeless. It's deeper than life and death. It's without conditions. If you look for it, you can't see it. It goes in and out without a gate. If you shrink it, it exists in one square inch. If you stretch it, it is everywhere. If you don't trust and treasure it, 
you can't encounter it. Ah, the paradoxical nature of peace and contentment. Let's sit for a moment or two. Thank you for your practice. Great gratitude. And the uh, metta chant is very soon at uh, 3.30. Have a good walking. <laughs>